Welcome to the Eyes Up Mindset Podcast, where we explore what it means to grow daily and find our best in every aspect of life. What is going on, everybody? This is John Shirky here with my friend, my co-host, Jamie Wagner, bringing you another episode of the Eyes Up Mindset Podcast. We're blessed and honored that you choose to join us each week where we have interesting conversations. We talk about how you can apply these things to your life. We love to hear from you. So check us out on our social media. It's Eyes Up Mindset. Send us a message. How are you choosing to live eyes up each day? So all that to say, Jamie, as always, good to see you. How you doing? You as well, man. Uh, I'm doing well. It is ridiculously cold in the winter. upper Midwest. Yeah, it's, it's the dead of winter. But uh, you said, and we've we've said it a few times today in our conversations, just this ability to have interesting conversations. As I was writing in the course of the last week, I keep coming back to this place of hard conversations, these conversations that push us and challenge us and move us, right? Don't just think about it. Don't just think that we can do the thing, get out there and act. And as a result, last week, I decided to start running again in the middle of the cold. And I'm, I'm now six days in a row. Um, today will be seven. It's above zero here today, though. So that's a win. What? So, I mean, not that we, this is, we have a whole other episode coming. I mean, we have a whole conversation, but now that you brought it up, what's the mental battle been like? Physically, I know you can do six days. What have yeah. you learned over the six days where, you know, thoughts or, you know, emotions, things that are going through your head? The reason I haven't run much in the last, I don't know, decade is that <laughs> <laughs> I messed up my knee playing ball my senior year, playing football uh, my senior year. I, I messed up my knee and I never really got it fixed. Uh, and I make that an excuse all the time. And so the first instance it comes up when I'm running or when I'm doing something physical, I'm like, eh, that's why I don't do this. And then I just don't do it the next day. And um, one of the things when I was getting back into playing guitar, as I'm writing, as I read is like, just don't miss two days in a row, right? That's, that's the thing. And so as I'm, as I'm going through it, as I'm on the road running outside, like in the cold, I will not run on a treadmill, by the way, um, is when it comes up, it's like, it's okay. Like when I feel the knee is being able to tell myself, Hey, you only, you need to do it enough to know if that is the problem, because right now I don't actually know that that's the problem. That's the thing I tell myself is the problem. Um, and I think we get into that situation all the time in other areas of life. Oh, I can't do this because blank, but we don't actually know that that's the problem. And now on day six, I don't really notice it as much. And I'm sure day 25, I certainly won't notice it as much. So, um, you gotta so, give yourself a chance, I think is what I'm learning. Yeah. And, and it sounds like no excuses, right? Don't, yeah. don't allow things to come up. That's that say, no, I'm not going to do that. Right. I'm, I'm going to do it. And when the excuse comes, it's acknowledging it and saying, Nope, I'm going to make a different choice today, which I think is a perfect example of the conversation we get into today. We have John Creasel, who is a motivational, inspirational speaker, does some work with veterans in, in the twin cities metro area his story if you have not heard it is incredible um he's got a book you can you know check out all of that stuff but the sh the long and short of it was he, he had an injury while he was serving in iraq lost both of his legs and now is in a place where you know you'll hear him he jokes he laughs he has this outlook on life that it's like i'm not gonna let any excuse if anybody has an excuse to not do something, it's, it's him. Right. But every day he talked about every day, waking up and saying, I, I'm not going to let that get in my way today. And then to be able to say, I'm going to find my passion, find passions again, find my value and my worth again, even though my identity maybe was taken from me or was, was moved beyond me. And that's something I think we all experience in some way, shape or form, you know? And so, uh, his message powerful. I loved our conversation. He, you know, he's a guy I've been listening to a long time on K fan. Um, you know, so if you recognize the name, that is the same John Creasel and he just gives us unbelievable stuff that I think don't just listen for the story. Listen for the stuff he's telling you underneath it. Cause it's there and it's good. Incredibly grateful for him that he challenged us today. He's going to challenge you get your pens, paper, ready to go. John Creasel. 
John, welcome to the podcast. It's our pleasure to have you. Thanks for joining us. You got it. Thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about what you're up to these days. You know, and you're, you're speaking. I know you have a book out. Um, what's, what's a day in the life of John Creasel look like these days? So, so my, uh, I, I'm married with, with an 18-month-old baby girl. Uh, we live in just south of St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, my regular job is I'm a veteran services officer for a, a county in the suburban Twin Cities. I help veterans get VA benefits, kind of cut through the red tape of the process to get access to the VA. And then I also am a motivational speaker, inspirational speaker, and I appear on KFAN Power Trip Morning Show uh, once a week, every Friday. Which we love, by the way. I, I'm glad. We, we appreciate that. that. Uh, you What's know, being, not to love, right? I know, I know. <laughs> um, so you, you alluded to this reality that you go and speak and do some motivational speaking. Your story is incredible. And I've, you know, being a Minnesotan and listening to the power trip since I've been, you know, 20, probably, um, I, I knew, you know, I knew some of your story for a long time, but maybe some of our listeners don't know you served a tour in Iraq and had some pretty dramatic stuff, some life-changing stuff happen while you were there. Yeah, we were, um, we had a, it was supposed to be a 12 month deployment. And by the end of the first year, our guys ended up getting extended after I'd been injured, but uh, one of the patrols were on, we encountered a 200 pound improvised explosive device uh, detonated directly underneath my vehicle. And uh, that is kind of, I, I mean, not to oversimplify everything, but that is the, the basis of the speeches I give as I talk about that day, what it was like, um, the fact that I'll, I'll never forget waking up after the bomb went off because I don't remember, I do remember hearing the bomb go off like this metallic clank sound because they were it was in propane tanks as it turns out i don't remember flying through the air and i don't remember hitting the ground but i remember waking up on the ground hearing the rocks falling here and the chaos around me uh realizing and i i joke that i didn't want to believe what had just happened but i've been a vikings fan my whole life so i'm used <laughs> the worst case scenario um see, looking down and seeing my legs severely injured they ended up getting amputated um I had a broken arm hanging there. Uh, the amount of blood I saw, I was, I was certain that I was not going to survive. And so having that um, really set the tone for the rest of my life, being able to look back on that moment. And some people might say that they wish that they, they, they wouldn't remember if they had been in that spot. But since I didn't think I was going to survive, when I woke up eight days later at Walter Reed in, in the United States, Walter Reed Army Medical Center, um, saw that I was in a hospital room, saw that I was alive. It really helped put things in perspective. As I looked down, I saw that my left leg had been amputated above the knee, right leg below the knee. Um, no, I wasn't surprised that that happened because they were, you know, when I saw the injuries right after the blast, it was clear that uh, they, they weren't going to be usable anymore. Um, so seeing that, being convinced that I was going to die and then realizing that I was alive, it helped really kind of minimize my situation. I knew I was going to have a huge uh, recovery ahead of me, a lot of physical therapy, a lot of surgeries, but I could at least look back on it and say, at least I survived. It could be a lot worse. And in fact, I learned shortly after waking up at Walter Reed that two of my best friends that had been in that vehicle uh, had died. And so from that moment on, I realized it would be crappy of me to sit here and feel sorry for myself when I got a second chance at life that my friends didn't get. And that's that's how I've tried to live my life uh, since that happened. Well, and I think so. You, your your speeches and your book still still standing, still smiling, and and kind of the tagline. You know, you you talk about positivity, optimism, passion. Like, where does that come from? I mean, because not everybody has certainly not everybody has an experience like you had, but we all have adversity. We all have bad stuff that happens, and when when something like that happens you know, generally we go back to something that's pretty deep inside of us as our response, right? So where, for you, where do you think that positivity, that optimism, that outlook of, I have no choice, but to kind of go forward here and make the most of my situation now, where does that come from for you? Uh, I, I think 
from my upbringing uh, a, a little bit. Um, I had a good childhood, but there was some adversity, um, just some stuff that my family had been through. And I learned from, I think my dad was a good example of sometimes things suck so bad. You just got to laugh about it. You know, he had a terrible upbringing, like dirt floor, no running water. He was the second youngest of 13 kids, dirt poor. Like they, and he worked his way up to, to get a good job in Minnesota, provide for my sister and I, and, and my mom. And, um, I, I think just watching him and, and of course there's always issues there and it, it's, it's, it's easy for me to say, here's the, the recipe for how to get through this kind of thing. Um, I think that's kind of where it was ingrained, but attitude is a, is a choice we make. And I'd be lying if I said that every day at Walter Reed, I have that great attitude. Um, Cause that's not true. There's times where, I mean, we call it the Walter Reed shuffle It's like three, three steps forward, five steps back. Sometimes that's just how it works. And, um, you, you have to make a decision early on that, it, that you're going to have a positive attitude. You're going to make the best out of the situation you're in. Otherwise, you'll be there forever. I didn't want to be a permanent resident at the hospital. And I knew that after having been through what I did, I realized how precious life is and that I have a chance here. To I got a second chance. And it's up to me to make today great and the next day and the next day and work my butt off to get better and make my life better. And then it just becomes the way you live your life. You know, it becomes habit. It becomes ritual, how you do things. So you talk about being at Walter Reed and understanding that these challenges and that, that adversity would come. Did you develop any sort of practice around some of the mental stuff that you were facing? I know that like I look at some Eastern religion and Eastern philosophy and stuff. It's, it's about living a life, a living, living practice, right. Of meditation or yoga or some of those things. I'm not saying that that was your practice, but is there something that you developed in that time that you took out of that, that became habit, that became ritualized, that became something because of that specific experience that you were able to integrate into your life moving forward. And, and it might just be around, but it was a, a series of statements. I don't know, maybe there wasn't something, but I, I think with the, you just, your mind gets adjusted to the fact that usually at least at first when I was in the hospital, it was basically every other day or every third day I would have a surgery. They would go in and clean stuff up, do stuff, revision. And a lot of times they'd come back with some not great news. And so balancing that is not just expecting bad news all the time, um, which again, like I said, as a Vikings fan, I'm accustomed to that. Um, <laughs> But just being more prepared for it and knowing that, okay, the last set of challenges I had two days ago, uh, you know, in the hospital, I overcame that and I was fine. And so just kind of knowing and being prepared for that, you, you kind of, I don't want to say become like callous to it, but it's your life. Yeah. And, it, and it's weird because you're in this big bubble where the person in the room next to you is missing limbs, person in the room on the other side of you is missing limbs that it kind of becomes weird when you go out to, if we'd go to the Olive Garden or something, then you're like, okay, this is not Walter Reed. I am the only person missing limbs here. Then you see that really our little world we live in at Walter Reed is, is not the norm. And you kind of adjust to that and, and you know that it's not the norm, but when you live it every single day and everything's set up for people just like you going through the exact same thing you are or went through and, um, that I, I think you, you learn to develop a skill set to get through things. But then as you have been there a while, it's learning that I'm not always going to have that support system that I had in that hospital when I come back to Minnesota. And I, I learned that. And then it was a brand new adjustment. So what was that like coming back to Minnesota, going through that process of the recovery? Because like you said, I think when we're in an environment that fosters that, that Everything looks similar to us. Everybody has the same experience. And now we go back home or to a different environment and now it's brand new. I mean, I, I assume that the process is similar, right? There's some sort of reflection, reminding, reframing to yourself, hey, I can do this. I've been through these things. I can do this today. But what was that like coming back home and having to adjust? Um, it, it was definitely weird because that Walter Reed, it's there's control measures set up there. There's no matter what happens to you, there's going to be, it's happened to someone else and they're going to figure out a way to, to help with it and, and 
you know everything's going to be okay. When you get back here, it's like training wheels are off. All those things I learned. And full disclosure, I do not have a bit of PTSD. Um, or I do from the Vikings and that's it. I th At the hospital, they provided all the, the tools to be able to, to cope with things and move forward. And now, really, I, I, I don't have anything like that. When I first got home, though, there is a bit of an adjustment. And you have to you have to use the tools they've been given to you, but they're no good if you don't use them. And the adjustment period that okay, now back here, everything's not set up for people like me. And a lot of places are accessible. And at that time, I was mostly using prosthetics. I went at the hospital; it was mostly wheelchair, and you get used to the prosthetic legs. But then at at this point. It wasn't, if I was tired, I'd have to look at, okay, is there a bench to sit on? If I went somewhere, I'd have to know, is there going to be a way to sit down after a little bit and kind of thinking about logistically like that. But the mental aspect, I think, was the most difficult. And you go back because you, you come back here and the world doesn't stop for you. Everything, everything, the, the show must go on. And, and, and that's tough because at Walter Reed, something happens to you it's like you can just stop everything and you're like, all right, this needs to get fixed. We're here. The friends and family, they all go back to work. They do their normal thing. I had two stepkids uh, in that marriage that, that I was having to get to daycare and, and to school. That helped kind of create some normalcy because I had something to do. But it really, it took time. I spent so much time convincing everybody that I was fine that I didn't really take time to make sure I was fine. And I had to really, you get to a point then where, because my ex-wife had to go back to work, that I didn't get a chance really to be selfish. Like you got to really, you do. And there's a reason on the airplane, if there's a loss of oxygen or cabin pressure, the mask drops, you got to put yours on first because you're no help to others if you're passed out. And so I was running at such a high RPM, taking care of the kids, doing this, doing that. Well, she went back to work that it really, um, I think it slowed down my development, my growth as a, as a person until I got kind of settled in. And I think it was about the next year that I really was like, all right, where am I at compared to where I was at at the hospital? What do I need to do? Where do I want to be? I had never really set goals. So what do I want to do? Instead of just saying, I'm going to set up, I'm going to make sure that my family is set up for the best career possible. Well, Am I contributing anything? How, so I had to go and find a career that was a good transitional period into civilian life, a sense of purpose. And that's a lot where KFAN came in. Yeah. So I, we think about, I can only imagine the challenges, right? I, I think you talked about the mental barriers that it, it takes to overcome and, and it being much more difficult than the physical barriers, which a lot of us listening are going, how is that possible? You know, I, I think we empathize with that reality, but we think like how, right. How is that the more challenging portion learning, you know, but I think one of the things that I, I was thinking about when knowing we were going to talk to you is this, this piece about identity, you were a soldier, you were probably pretty physically fit, pretty active. Um, my guess is an athlete of some sort. If, you, if you're a Vikings fan, you have to go out and run just to get rid of the, the pain sometimes, right? <laughs> how, do you, how do you manage this thing that is people look at me differently? People see me from a different perspective. I view myself differently when this massive change happens. And, and admittedly for you, it's something that we're not necessarily going to identify with, but at the same time, we all move, we all lose jobs. We all have different situations in life that are these big moments of this is who I was. And I'm no longer that person. Mm -hmm. What is that? What was that struggle like for you mentally or getting to the other side of that? How did you, how'd you do that? I don't, I mean, it, I mean, a lot of it, 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 Listen. it took time. I mean, and persistence because things don't go well and you can't go, well, that didn't work. So I'm done. That's going to be a heck of a way to go through life and going through other stuff. I mean, coming back, it's, it, it was chaos going through marital issues with that, that marriage that I was in at that time and having to, to really grow to like who I was. And I, I, again, I, I've always been a happy person. And so 
I don't want to make it sound like even when the marriage, when that marriage was going bad and the things I went through in that, like poor me, because I was still a happy person. I, I had good coping mechanisms from the hospital and all of that, that I was able to, to help it, which is probably why it dr- drug on a lot longer than it should have. But when you go through kind of what I did, I came back and again, yes, I had been athletic. I had been, you know, I played in a lot of the bar leagues, whether it was bar league football, bar league softball, all that. And even something as simple as that. Um, so I don't know if we want to call that a- an athlete per se, because I know a lot of the people <laughs> I was going against weren't athletes, but um, they could hit the ball far. You can picture those guys, the one you always stick at first base. Yeah, for sure. But so there's, I, there's certainly some identity and some community involved. in yes. that. Right? I, I mean, I played a lot of bar league softball for a long time and it's like, you get tied up in that. Like I go, you go play, you play on Tuesday nights, you play on Thursday nights, you play on Saturday and Sunday. So you get into this community of people that you're like, Hey, I want to do this thing and be around these people. Cause this is who I am too. Right. You know, exactly. And then with this, there wasn't anyone back here like me, yeah. you know, I, I, there's a few that I know they don't live very close and, and they have different interests and whatnot. So you have to find something because that, that's the only other option. And when it got to a point, then I, when I was going through physical therapy at Walter Reed, my prosthetist, I have to be careful. I say that <laughs> I, works on my legs. Um, he liked golf and I used to love golf too. Um, and so he was like, well, this is a great way to fine tune your prosthetics to work on your belt. So I would go golfing and I loved it. And I grew to love the sport again. And I realized there's, there's ways that you can play the game for handicapped individuals and still compete with able-bodied people. And, and it's a time consuming game. So for a while, then when I got back to Minnesota, I didn't play it much a couple of times a summer last year, I got back into it and played it a ton and it, it made me so happy. And it's, again, it's the sport I feel the least um, disabled, but that was part of, I think going through what I did coming back and then going through the divorce, I had to love myself. And I realized the person I was married to didn't love me. And I realized that when you look at it and you go through what I did and you look at yourself differently, like I'm not having legs and I go, well, how is, how is any other woman going to love me if the person I'm married to doesn't, if she doesn't like a guy with no legs, how is anybody else going to? And that's kind of how I felt throughout that marriage based on, on actions that, that were taken. And I just kind of was like, all right, I need to, I need to take care of me. And again, like I had said that before, I never really did it for a while. And then I finally did. I found things I was passionate about. I ran for public office. I was elected to the Minnesota House of Representatives after knocking on thousands of doors um, in a race that I wasn't supposed to win. Um, doing that, having doing, I feel like a pretty good job representing the people in my district. Um, then moving on to the job that I have now, all the while I was on KFAN and that always gave me some, some things to look forward to. But once I got through that and I realized I am a useful person, I do have things to offer. I'm a good guy. I'm a good husband. Um, that I finally then feel like I could grow. And that was about 2016 that I finally said adios to, to the, to the wife and uh, was able really to focus on me then. And now this all makes me sound selfish, uh, but it really, once I did that, I've never been happier. And I've met someone who, who bought me off of the clearance rack and, uh, and I'm happily married now. And it's, um, I look back on it and I'm like, how did I put up with what the things I did? But it's part of the growing process instead of being like, well, I wasted 11 years of my life. I didn't because really I went through that and it made me the person I am today, the person that Kayla married. So. No. And I I think you, you talk about a couple of things that we are pretty core to who we are reflection, reframing, and you kept saying it over and over. Like what have I come through? Where am I at now? Right. And what are the expectations? I used to love golf mm-hmm. and I didn't think I could do it. Right. And then you got back into it and you're like, oh, well, but at some point along that way, you, you had to have said, okay, this is more realistic to expect of myself. And then you fell back in love with it. Right. Absolutely. I think that's, I think that's something that, you know, I, 
most people can relate to something that they used to love. And then it'd be like, Oh, it'd be great. I was just having this conversation with my brother the other day. He asked me if I've played basketball. I played a lot of basketball and, and I said, no, I haven't played in probably two years. And, and for me, it was like, well, I don't, I don't really want to now. Cause I don't know if I can do it. I don't, you know, cardio wise, like I'm just not the same athlete that I was, but the reality is like, how do you reset those expectations for yourself and reframe that and, and understand that whatever you've just come through is because it's going to make you better today. Right. Absolutely. And you, you get out there and play hoops. <laughs> do it. No, I, I, I had kind of given up on golf because I was kind of looking at previous me and I was a crappy, crappy golfer before I lost my legs. And I do I actually remember getting lessons and I forgot it was at one of the chains and the guy had said, he said, this is a disaster. He was like, you're doing too much with your lower body. He said, take your legs out of it. I wish I kept that guy's card because I would have went back and said, ta-da. <laughs> and now that I, I did, I golf better now than I did when I had legs. I don't hit it as far, but the fundamentals are better because they have to be because I have smaller room for air. But um, it just, it reignited the passion when I re- set my expectations. Like, like you had said, I wasn't, I'm not going to be able to hit the ball 250. I'm not going to be able to do this, do that. If it's a really tough sand trap, I'm not going in there. I'll take the ball retriever. I'll take the penalty. I'll drop it out. Um, and, and that's that. And my goal last year and, and my goal for many years, but last year I got serious about it was breaking a hundred. A lot of people would be like, that's pretty easy. Um, it, it took me a lot of work, a lot of lessons. And I broke 100 last year. I got my first hole in one. And then I, towards the end of the year, I was going to break 90, which was unheard of. But then instead, I must have had a little crack in my arm where I had a break from the bomb blast. So uh -huh. I have rods there. And my arm hurt all through August, September. But I'd never been golfing better. Because when I would swing, my arm would hurt, but I was fine with that because I, I wouldn't over swing and I was golfing awesome. So I was like, my arm can hurt forever. Well, I took the day off of work on October 8th, day after my birthday, two of my buddies that were there at that incident in Iraq, one of the guys that saved my life, one of the guys in the seat behind me, um, we we're going to golf. We took the day off of work so we could drink a bunch of beers, have a great time. First swing on the driving range, I felt my arm pop. And I was like, what? Went to the doctor. They had said it had been broken for a couple months. And I just was playing through it. <laughs> and so uh, I just recently got the green light to go swinging uh, again early last month. So That's awesome. I yeah. love that. I, That's I mean, my rambling little story there. But yeah, it, I had to reset my expectations. And then I, if I kept being like, oh, yeah, I want to be a, a five handicap. It's not going to happen. Now I have the coolest handicap, no legs, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, it's a blast. So I, I think about this. I also, you mentioned you have an 18 month old daughter. I have a 15 month old daughter and I'm, and I'm thinking about this. It's yeah. It's amazing, right? It's, it's this world that you can't explain until you've been there. And what, what do you think is the biggest thing for her? right. That, that you can give her through this experience. What, what is that thing that you say? Okay. Cause I mean, clearly as an athlete, I've learned a million things that I hope to be able to give to her because I've had this opportunity to do things in ways that not everybody has had. And I've had great teachers and mentors and coaches. I'm sure the same has been true in your experience. What is something that you look back on and say, I hope she gets this most importantly, I want her to be resilient. I want her to understand that things aren't always going to go our way. A lot of times they're not going to go our way, um, but that's okay. And, and if I could pick the person I want on my team, I don't want the person that always, it's always easy for them. It always goes their way. They never face adversity. I want the one who's made it through adversity and come out stronger. So that, knowing that being mentally tough, and again, that's, I can't teach her that she's going to have to learn it. I can try to set an example for her, but that being kind to people, being hardworking. I mean, really, if you have just those few things, life's going to work out for you most of the time. 
John, I, incredible stuff today. I, I I think I said this when I was connecting with you. I have a brother who's an army chaplain right now. He's he's in the military, about to get out. So I, I think there's some parallels in terms of the life transition stuff that he's going to have to go through here. Mm-hmm. Um, and I and I think there's a lot of veterans and and people and I just have civilians now too because of what we've been through the last year that are going through transition. So I I appreciate your message. I love it. I. I Excited that you came on. Where, where can people get to your stuff if they want to hear you speak or hire you or connect with what you're doing? Yes, they can find me on any of the, the social media platforms. I'm on Twitter, at John Creasel. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Instagram, all of those. And then my website is johncreasel.com. It's K-R-I-E-S-E-L. They can find video clips from my speeches um, how to, how to request more information to hire me to speak, uh, or just to learn more about me and, uh, and my book still standing, uh, the story of staff Sergeant John Creasel. That's also available on Amazon and anywhere you can buy books. And then Friday mornings on the fan, right? Of I mean, course, 5 30 to about seven twenty is when I'm on every Friday on KFAN. Right on. Thanks for coming, John. We loved having you on your messages powerful and uh we hope our listeners can can take some pieces from it you got it thanks for having me on thanks again to john creasel for joining us incredibly humbling to hear him tell his story jamie about going through that experience and still now he's here he is laughing he's telling jokes he's he's sharing his story and every day makes the choice you know he talked about Every day, attitude is a choice. You get to choose. And um, yeah, incredibly humbling and and such a such a cool experience to get to connect with him. Just briefly in our in our little interim between you talked about referencing our last episode with Angelo Cisco about the difference between motivation and inspiration. He mentioned the difference. I'm not a motivational speaker. He he just caught himself. He said, I'm an inspirational speaker. Why did that land with you so much? No, I think because, you know, we, we always talk about, or we try to get to what is the takeaway? How do we apply this? Right. And I think, you know, that was, I think his point when he switched that, because he, he doesn't want to be a motivational speaker. And for us, we don't want this to be motivational. We want this to inspire you to live differently. We talk about living eyes up, right. Living in a certain way that you're going to make a choice every day to get better. And, and so you know, that was our conversation was, I don't want people to just hear this and be like, oh, that's a sweet story. And I'm, I'm, I'm excited for today. Yeah, great. But then how do you carry that forward to change the way that you live in some way to, to get better? Well, and, and ultimately that is the takeaway because it's not just how do you create movement beyond today? How do you, how are you inspired to deal with today? But how are you inspired to deal with the bad days? Chris talked about it, right? This every day is going to be great thing isn't real. It's never real, no matter if you're dealing with a hugely life-defining, life-changing trauma like he had to in a hospital where he had the support. It's still not going to be every day is a great day. What can you do when it's tough? Because there will be plenty of those days where it's not easy, where the supports aren't there where the transition is too hard. Will you choose to live eyes up anyway? Because that's what it's about. Not just today, every day, and especially the days when it's hard. And as always, live eyes up. <laughs>